A number of people who frequent our work have requested a more detailed video regarding one of the mysteries we so often focus upon here on the channel. There are many sites that we feel are deserving of in-depth focus. Our mission has always been to enlighten those who may not have been aware of the many different, compelling, and often controversial realities surrounding countless ancient ruins that throughout their lives have been explained away with a lie. Undoubtedly, the most well-known, most commonly explored, and thus the ruin most suited for our viewers' acquirement of a knowledge armory is Giza. Indeed, there are many people you will meet throughout your life that will have delved into the mysteries of Egypt. However, this experience, unbeknownst to them, may have been fraught with a limited, illogical, academic account regarding the history of Giza's plateau. This video, then, is our gift to our viewer. To prove to all those who act like they know it all how little they actually do. The characteristics of the casing stones are undoubtedly one of our own most noted achievements. We feel little, if any, notice has been given to the facts we have realized regarding these stones. Yet the evidence we have found will remain clear for all to see. These casing stones, although of an enormous size, and as such were left by a lost civilization, are far younger than the sandstone in which they encase. Most of these casing stones, unfortunately robbed out during invasions within the last few centuries, are protecting stones which are actually far more eroded and thus far older beneath. However, additionally, we began to wonder just how old could the Great Pyramids be? Could these eroding sandstones actually be concealing a far larger, far older structure beneath? Also discovered here on our channel, the supporting evidence to this hypothesis, most notably along the east side of Khufu and in numerous other places where the smaller sandstones have been robbed out, is, as we suspected, a far larger exoskeleton. We strongly believe these enormous megalithic blocks that we have previously estimated to be many hundreds of tons in weight are actually the original oldest blocks of the pyramids. We also believe that the more modern, currently recognized casing stones were actually inspired by these more heavily eroded smaller sandstone blocks now concealing these mammoth megaliths. This makes the layers we believe that adorn the Great Pyramid numbers three, with the two more modern layers being conservation efforts, undoubtedly undertaken at vastly different times within history. Just how old is the Great Pyramid? Just how impressive was ancient Egypt? For example, the oldest surviving obelisk at Heliopolis, and therefore in Egypt, was undeniably cut transported and lifted into position at an unknown time in history, using now lost technology and knowledge. It is a stone 20 meters in height, weighing an astonishing 121 tons. And this enormous, unexplainable, impossible monolith is not the only one left upon the plateau. There are many more dotted all over Giza. For example, the sarcophagus of Amenemet III a pair of quartzite monoliths, discovered in the early 20th century, hang above this supposed tomb. These gigantic stones effortlessly support the weight above, each estimated to weigh 110 metric tons. The Colossi of Memnon, these two gigantic artworks were built from single pieces of stone. They are orientated toward the sunrise at winter solstice estimated to weigh anywhere from 600 to 1,000 tons each. Modern technology allows for the movement of such weights. However, any civilization claimed by academia, actually once being responsible for the transportation of such stones, is absurd. Who could have possibly transported such enormous stones to these locations? Not only transported them, but worked them into masterpieces they once were disposing of all waste, presumably also weighing many tons. And there are many others. In the temple east of Khafre's Pyramid, for example, there lay blocks regularly, yet quietly estimated to weigh over 400 tons. How can modern academia claim such tasks were undertaken by our modern ancestors? 
anyone aware of the true accomplishments involved in the construction of the Giza Plateau must now see this hypothesis as severely lacking any satisfactory explanations. Mortuary Temple of Menkaura still possesses some astonishing unexplained feats. There are some estimates of the blocks within the temple, most notably within the surviving walls of the mortuary, weighing as much as 220 tons. The heaviest granite ashlars, imported from Aswan Quarry many miles away, weighing in at more than 30 tons. There are many incredible, inexplicable features upon the Giza Plateau. Many of them, unfortunately, yet predictably, little shared academically. Yet it remains a place of invaluable existent truths, many discrediting that which are passed off as current academic fact. Giza is an astonishing place, and the one we feel most likely to expose academia once and for all. It is a plateau we find highly compelling. There are many ancient anomalies which can be found upon the Giza Plateau and indeed across much of ancient Egypt as a whole. Many areas which are clear evidence of a highly capable, highly intelligent past civilization who once called this landmass home. Not only are the ancient pyramids a clear feat of incredible ancient engineering, possibly the most astonishing found the world over, but many of the still existing ancient temples are testament to a now lost, yet once incredibly advanced ancient civilization. And although many academics are funded to push the theory that the pyramids, having once been the burial places of Egyptian kings, the truth that we still do not actually know the original purpose for these ancient structures remains. Not only do these structures, along with many other areas, such as the basalt floor found at their feet, still show clear evidence of lost technology, unquestionably left by high-speed, high-rotation stone-cutting technologies, and many of the tombs and other artifacts found throughout the ancient ruins, unarguably once machine-worked upon enormous, as yet unexplained lathes. But there also exist some astonishing features within the record books, documented anomalies within our own antiquity regarding some of the biggest yet still existing anomalies within ancient Egypt, anomalies that although are now all but lost to history, have been recorded and documented since our own records began, specifically Roman records. The Colossi or Colossus of Memnon are listed as containing some of the largest megalithic blocks that have currently been recorded and investigated across the world, and although these statues have virtually crumbled over the eons, Records of these statues stretches back many centuries, features now largely, and we believe, deliberately ignored by mainstream academics. These statues once possessed an astonishing characteristic, one many claimed as a divine experience, one which would draw countless individuals on a pilgrimage across the desert, to witness at first light every morning. The Colossi of Memnon were built from a single piece of stone each they are oriented towards the sunrise at winter solstice, and throughout modern study have had a number of fearless individuals expose their true past grandeur to the world. Estimates for the two statues' original weight are most commonly noted to have been around the 1,000 tons mark, with the most famous report within R.T. Gould's A Book of Marvels, 1937, which contained an estimate of 1,200 tons. The statues are made from blocks of quartzite sandstone, which was quarried at El Gabal El Amar, near modern-day Cairo, then transported 420 miles to Thebes. And although modern academia would like to attribute these feats to our more modern ancestors, namely the ancient Egyptians, any logical explanation of how this feat was achieved, or indeed how they were so precisely carved, remains absent from all explanations of these monumental statues, not only their transport and creation, but how these ancient monuments used to sing. Early Greek and Roman tourists who came to hear the sound gave the statue the name of Memnon. Memnon was a hero of the Trojan War, a king of Ethiopia, who led his armies to Troy's defense, but was ultimately slain by Achilles. Memnon was said to be the son of Eos, the goddess of dawn, 
and after his death, his mother is said to have shed tears every morning. The singing of the statues was attributed to this mother mourning for her son. The earliest written reference to the singing statues comes from the Greek historian and geographer Strabo, who claimed to have heard their song during a visit in 20 BC. The second century Greek traveler and geographer Pausanias compared it to the string of a lyre breaking. Others described it as the striking of brass or a strange, ghostly, almost divine whistling. For more than two centuries, the singing statues brought tourists from all over the empire, including several Roman emperors. Many left inscriptions on the base of the statue, reporting whether they had heard the sound or not. Nearly 90 inscriptions are still legible upon their base today. Who created these statues? How were they able to sing? They are clearly an astonishing ancient accomplishment, once achieved by a now lost advanced civilization. Monuments which we find highly compelling. Many precious artifacts have been recovered within Egypt over the years. Many ancient Egyptian tombs found intact, untouched for millennia, still containing the valuable items left for their kings, with the intention of their beloved pharaoh's use in their passage to the afterlife. And with the mountains of gold and glistening jewels which have captured the attention and the hearts of those who have explored these ancient archives, a lot of the most astounding relics go largely unnoticed. The solar boat could be seen as a particularly good example of this mass overlooking of the most interesting of things. At the foot of the Great Pyramid, once beneath several multi-ton, precisely placed blocks of limestone, lay the Khufu ship, a full-sized ancient Egyptian vessel sealed into a pit over 4,000 years ago. Why is more not heard regarding this astonishing find? Strongly believed to have been built for Khufu, King Cheops, who was the second pharaoh of the fourth dynasty of the Old Kingdom of Egypt. The ship is now preserved in the Giza Solar Boat Museum, built at the site in 1985. It is completely dedicated to the preservation of the boat, possessing state-of-the-art preservation technologies. Khufu's ship is one of the oldest, largest, and best-preserved vessels from antiquity. It measures 44 meters long and 6 meters wide. It is also acknowledged as the world's oldest intact ship, and has been described by all in the know as a masterpiece of woodcraft. It could sail today if put into water. However, what is clearly the most amazing fact regarding the solar ship, the vessel was never intended to sail on water. The solar boat was built to sail through the air. It was built largely of Lebanon cedar planking in the shell first construction technique, using unpegged tenons of Christ's thorn. The ship was built with a flat bottom composed of several planks, but no actual keel, with the planks and frames lashed together with halfa grass. The boat was found complete, but in pieces across the layer's floor, laid in a logically disassembled order beneath the pyramid. Subsequently reconstructed from the 1,224 pieces which were laid out in order over 45 years prior. It took several years for the boat to be painstakingly reassembled, primarily by the Egyptian Department of Antiquities chief restorer, Ahmed Youssef Mustafa. Before reconstructing the boat, he had to gain enough experience on ancient Egyptian boat building. He studied the reliefs carved on walls and tombs and many of the little wooden models of ships and boats found in tombs. Ahmed also visited the Nile boatyards of Old Cairo and Mahadi and went to Alexandria, where wooden river boats were still being made. It is now believed to have been known as a solar barge, a ritual vessel to carry the king with the sun god Ra across the heavens. However, it bears some of the signs of having been used, a fact which has baffled many researchers due to the ship's only purpose being that of floating in the sky. It is possible that the ship was either a funerary barge, used to carry the king's embalmed body from Memphis to Giza, or even that Khufu himself used it as a pilgrimage ship to visit holy places and that it was buried for him to use in the afterlife. Yet burning questions arise from such conclusions. Firstly, how would the ship fly? Secondly, 
If the ship was indeed intended to be used in King Khufu's afterlife, why was it resting in pieces beneath the pyramid? And why did it show wear from use within the king's life? Did this ship somehow once possess the power of flight? Did ancient Egyptians? We have been covering a lot recently in regards to the compelling evidence left by the ancient Egyptians, revealing their advanced ability to traverse most of the Earth prior to Columbus. Is the solar ship a piece of this puzzle? Kamal el Malak, who somehow predicted the existence of the ship, and has been attributed with its discovery in 1954 through his extensive personal research of the area over 14 years, initially found another pit also at the foot of the Great Pyramid. Unfortunately, it seems this layer had been robbed shortly before he found it. Archaeologists and Egyptologists alike rejected his claims of some sort of ship having been within this empty cavern. Yet when the other pit was found, which did indeed contain a ship, his prior claim was vindicated. How did Kamal know? He would later claim that he believed something rather special was stolen from that first cavern. Could it have been the thing which made the ship work? Regardless of this other cavern's lost contents, the solar boat is certainly an amazing thing in its own right. The Terracotta Army Undoubtedly the most astonishing collection of carvings, whether mold-based or not, to be found anywhere on Earth. The artistic genius on display within this large terracotta army is hard to ignore when, according to academia, they were merely the handiwork of untrained slaves. Not only does the army display an immense level of detail and thus artistic talent, they are also all seemingly unique as if each soldier was an accurate recreation of an ancient individual in full armor. We have, in the past, covered this astonishing discovery, discussing how the temple in which this army is said to be protecting has supposedly never been opened, this even though upon excavating the original entranceways, sophisticated crossbows tipped with poison arrows were found left each on a butterfly trigger like something straight out of an Indiana Jones movie. Whatever these elaborate defenses were protecting has, according to Chinese authorities, never been explored. What's more, this same notoriously secret government have also made any future digs illegal, quashing all hopes for anyone who would like to know about this clearly intriguing section of history. However, these incredible features, along with the soldiers' average giant sizes, were not the only area of study we have explored regarding the army. In our first video regarding the amazing site, we explored the highly mysterious monoatomic pigment that was found on many of the statues, popularly known as Han Purple. This astonishingly complex pigment, although apparently sourced and manufactured in enormous amounts by a far less capable, more primitive ancestor, was not fully understood until the 1990s. A pigment that, according to scientists who have studied it, exhibits characteristics of, quote, an element of a lower dimension, end quote, and as such, according to mainstream paradigm, is an incredibly difficult artifact to explain. Yet, Han Purple is not the only incredible, highly enigmatic pigment dating from a now lost antiquity. There also exists another, no less impressive pigment which is highly likely to have originated within the now lost civilization we like to call the Pyramid Builders. Known as Egyptian Blue, this marvelous pigment was found during an investigation by the British Museum. The Parthenon Marbles, also known as the Elgin Marbles, are a collection of classic Greek marble statues, whose history, although heavily documented, display upon their surface not only evidence of an advanced ancient knowledge, most probably a leftover, still in circulation within top masons and sculptors around the time of the statue's creation. But this pigment, found during an in-depth investigation of the marbles, to discover whether they were once painted or not, was found in varying quantities upon their varying features, not only subsequently proving beyond doubt that the statues were indeed once painted, but like that of Han Purple within China, Egyptian blue also has a highly curious characteristic discovered by modern technology. 
It is not only the sole surviving pigment on the statues, but is only visible within the infrared spectrum, a band invisible to the human eye. Made under the supervision of the architect and sculptor, Phidias and his assistants, the origin of the pigment, however, just like that of Han purple, is unknown. Where did the knowledge for creating this pigment come from? Why is it now lost? Why does it emit colors invisible to the modern man's eye? We find not only Egyptian blue's infrared characteristics, but also Han purple's intriguing dimensionally deficient resonance as highly compelling. We have in the past covered a vast array of evidence which suggests the past existence of giants. Yet, alas, much of what is or has now either unfortunately been suppressed, destroyed, stolen, or forgotten about. With the remains of their initial discoveries now often only to be found remaining, proverbially, cast in stone in the form of the library archives of the world and the news reports now digitally preserved within. Often follow-up reports abruptly ceased, after the mention of the rapid arrival and insatiable interest of the Smithsonian, among others in said finds. However, now, thanks to the popularity of such subjects, the power and speed of modern technology, such finds made during excavations involving a large array of individuals make modern cover-ups difficult and are rarely accomplished. With the only modern, almost openly admitted one of note, having followed the discovery of the supposed tomb of Osiris, when all media was immediately banned from the site. When permitted back, the tomb had already been penetrated and was subsequently claimed as having been found empty, supposedly previously looted. This, regardless of its near impenetrability, with Gantenbrink only making it successful with modern robotics. But I digress. Working in cooperation, a team involving the Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, a team from the Penn Museum, University of Pennsylvania, among others, discovered a sarcophagus academically claimed as having belonged to a, quote, King Sobekteheb probably Sobekteheb, the first dated 1780 BC during the 13th dynasty. What we find astonishing regarding the find, however, is its sheer size. Carved from a single quarried piece of Aswan granite, initially weighing hundreds of tons, this finished tomb still weighs a minimum of 60 tons. It was somehow transported to the burial site and placed seemingly with delicacy where it now lay. Its resting place, inner chamber, also some three meters in length. The baffling enigmas of why such size? How were they moved? To explain how these feats were accomplished is far less difficult challenge if one incorporates into their postulations the possibility that the size of these tombs were, in fact, made to measure, indeed a match, to the height and scale of the civilization who buried them. Could the inclusion of ancient giants into the many other theories surrounding the mysteries of Giza solve the puzzle we still can't solve of how these stones were moved? It is a hypothesis which we find very fitting.